<laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Friday Transportation Seminar. I am Jennifer Dill. I am the director of TREC, and I will be introducing today's seminar. Our Friday transportation seminars have been a tradition since the year 2000. These seminars are usually held live on the Portland State University's urban campus, located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala, Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kailapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important that we acknowledge that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon the indigenous ancestors of this place. Remember, their, remember these communities and honor their legacy, lives, and descendants. Due to the COVID pandemic, um, we are still hosting this seminar fully online. So today's um, speaker, I'm very excited um, about having, and I'll, I'm going to introduce her now, and then we have a couple other slides before we go to her talk. Um, so we are very pleased today to have Adonia Lugo presenting on stories from the Bike Equity Network. Cultural anthropologist Adonia Lugo is the chair of the Urban Sustainability Department at Antioch University, Los Angeles. She was born and raised in traditional and unceded Ahachaman territory and now lives and works in traditional and unceded Tongva territory in Los Angeles. Lugo began investigating sustainable mobility, race, and space during her graduate studies at UC Irvine when she co-created Seek La Via and the organization today known as People for Mobility Justice in Los Angeles. After receiving her doctorate in 2013, she worked at the League of American Bicyclists in Washington, D.C. as the national leader in developing bike equity. In addition to her role at Antioch, L.A., Professor Lugo is an urban anthropologist at Pueblo Planning, a core organizer of the Untokening, and the co-founder of the Mobility Justice Network. And if you don't know, she has also written this lovely book um, called Bicycle Race that I highly recommend. So before jumping into her talk, I just want to um, share some information about some upcoming events, including the next Friday Transportation Seminar, um, which will be Madeline Brazen from UCLA on addressing gendered harassment and women's travel needs. And then if you are actually free this afternoon, um, we are co-hosting a seminar with the International and Global Studies Department at Portland State, and there is some information about that on our website, and that's at two o'clock today. Um, and then we also have a webinar coming up that you might be interested in. Uh, a little um, lesson about our Zoom webinar format, if you are um, not familiar with it. Um, we are recording the webinar and the recording and the slides will be posted on our website um, later on today. Um, we are approved for one credit um, hour of AICP professional development and there's um, information about that online. Um, most importantly, um, we expect that the presenter will go, um, that she will talk for about 40 minutes or so. We'll have some time for Q&A at the end. We ask that you put your questions in the Q&A um, function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, and that we will use those at the end um, of the seminar. Um, and then if you are using closed captioning, you must click the feature on the control panel to review. Uh, to see the closed captioning. With that, I am stopping sharing my screen and I am going to pass it over to Adonia. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, really nice to be here in this space. Uh, you know, this was, I think, I think it was this series is one of the very first places I was invited to be a presenter um, back in 2013, maybe. And, uh, and I've always appreciated uh, getting to be in, in dialogue with um, folks at PSU. So I am going to start sharing my screen and go back one slide. So here we are. Uh, I'm going to talk about stories from the Bike Equity Network. Uh, so uh, origin story. So the Bike Equity Network is an email list that I started uh, in 2013, at the end of 2013, 
when I had just uh, moved to Washington DC to work for the League of American Bicyclists, which as many of you know, is um, a, uh, a national level bicycle advocacy organization. Now, uh, I had a pretty unusual path toward working in uh, bicycling uh, and transportation research. Uh, my background is in cultural anthropology. And I had just completed a dissertation at that time that was about, uh, you know, how did race and class play roles in, uh, in making it seem like sustainable transportation options such as biking and walking and using public transit were bad ideas in a place like Southern California, uh, where I was born and raised, where we have beautiful weather, we have a lot of flat terrain, and yet for many, many people, the idea of walking in LA or biking in LA, riding the bus in LA is, uh, you know, way outside of the realm of what they would consider possible. And uh, what I learned over the course of my dissertation fieldwork in Los Angeles was that, um, you know, we play a role, infrastructure obviously plays a role, street design, um, you know, how cities have invested or not invested in uh, creating spaces for multimodal transportation. But we also play a role as people who are part of social networks, who are part of, uh, you know, reproducing these cultural attitudes. In cultural anthropology, uh, we, we tend to look at that a lot, the idea that when we are uh, raising children, when we're participating in uh, you know, spaces with family and friends or professional work, we're also um, uh, adopting cultural norms and sometimes changing cultural norms without really talking about it or focusing on it directly. And so uh, by the time I'd wrapped up my PhD in 2013, I was really interested in seeing how we could look at that sort of cultural norm shifting space as a, an approach for getting people more comfortable with sustainable transportation. And the jargon that I was using, because it was kind of in circulation in uh, the, the anthropological studies I was looking at at the time, was human infrastructure. Uh, so we could think of ourselves in our social networks, in our uh, cultural spaces as being a sort of infrastructure through which different ideas flow. So, um, you know, a really formative experience for me in my own life and also in my understanding of this idea was based on living in Portland. I went to college at, um, at Reed over in uh, Southeast Portland and uh, became a bicycle commuter after I graduated and was living and working in Portland. And it was really moving back to Southern California for graduate school that for me opened my eyes to uh, the really big differences in transportation culture that <laughs> existed between those two regions. And uh, so I myself started seeking out in Los Angeles people who were also bicycle commuters who I could go on bike rides with, who could show me ways to get around town. And um, I became part of a, a network of people um, based in the Koreatown neighborhood in Los Angeles who were car free, who uh, were actually really committed to navigating uh, LA through uh, mostly being on bicycles, transit, walking. And so becoming part of that network myself through the course of my dissertation field work on bicycling in LA, I, I kind of learned to look at it and say, oh, wow, so we're making it possible for each other to ride bikes in LA. Um, what could we do to maybe take what works for us and expand it for other people? At the same time that you know we were advocates uh, supporting you know investment in infrastructure at City Hall and uh, you know uh, choosing to get around the city in our own ways, we weren't waiting for those changes to happen. We were relating to the city in a way that worked for us. And so, what is it that made it work for us? How come we were able to ride bikes? And so I so I took this idea of human infrastructure with me once I finished my PhD and. Uh, went to work at the League of American Bicyclists. And uh, the equity initiative there had published this report that I have a, a graphic of the cover here um, that was called The New Majority, Pedaling Towards Equity. And that came out in early 2013. Um, it was done by Hamza Sani and Carolyn Chapansky. 
And what they pointed out in this report, which was something that more and more people in the bicycle industry and the bicycle advocacy and planning world were talking about, which was there's a demographic shift occurring in our country. And that means uh, we are not going to be a majority white country. We're actually um, already a, a country that has many uh, different uh, racial and ethnic groups who are living in a kind of plurality. And so this report was saying, this is the United States that we live in and that we will live in in the future. Uh, what are we doing to make sure that the bicycle movement and um, the kinds of things that we're asking for actually can serve uh, this, this population of, of the future? And so my role when I came in to run the equity initiative was, all right, how do we create uh, resources? How do we build networks, make different things happen so that uh, the League of American Bicyclists as a flagship organization of a bike movement or a bike advocacy uh, space could be promoting uh, more equitable outcomes. So for me, what I was trying to do was bring this human infrastructure idea into national bicycle advocacy and one of the first things i did was started this email list called the bike equity network i thought uh you know i had been part of a few different email lists in the past that had uh, really helped me to learn more about uh, research on bicycling that was coming from qualitative fields um, like sociology cultural studies uh, people who were working in um, these research fields over in the uk um, and I had co-founded an email list called BC Cultures in 2011 to help uh, make more of those connections. So I was kind of like, email lists work as a way to connect people who maybe aren't in dialogue yet, um, and they can share resources. So what if we made an email list about bike equity and we just kind of put the word out there and see who wants to join? And the original intentions were to create that space where different people could come together and be in dialogue. And one thing that I think is very important to note is when the league started this equity initiative and when I came in to work on it, there had already been dialogue around race and um, inequity in bicycling for quite some time. Um, there are, you know, a few existing networks out there, such as the National Brotherhood of Cyclists, um, major Taylor clubs that are linked throughout the country. There was a group called United Cycling Voices that was very influential in uh, bringing uh, this work to the league. So I was uh, kind of like, I felt like I was a newcomer to this conversation that had been ongoing. And so what I thought would be helpful with this email list was, connecting the folks who were in that conversation, many of whom were people of color, with uh, people in bicycle advocacy and um, uh, planning and research who wanted to support uh, moving toward equity and learning. So it's gonna be a learning space, a connection space, a dialogue space. And um, right off the bat, you know, I, I did a bunch of targeted um, invitations in partnership with the Equity Advisory Council that I got to work with through the league. And we got a whole bunch of people who wanted to join. And um, since it was part of my professional, uh, you know, job, I was really active in this space, starting uh, email threads and a lot of people were active. And so we had like a lot of cool dialogue going on. So into the next year, 2014, uh, one of the things that I ran into that first gave me some kind of like, oh, pause, like I don't know how to handle this, was a, a thread that got started um, by Ellie Blue, who many of you are familiar with. She's my editor at Microcosm Publishing, really big fan of um, her work in the bicycle space. She sent out a request um, looking for speakers. Uh, she wanted to just, you know, have a list of people that she could refer to. She was someone who got invited to be a speaker a lot um, and, and wanted to diversify who, who she was kind of passing on as references. And somebody who responded to, actually the very first person, if you look at the time signatures here, you know, it's within uh, 30 minutes, someone responded to this request where Ellie was specifically saying, I would love to, you know, get some names from women, from uh, black folks, from people of color to, uh, to bring in. This person wrote back and said, you know, uh, let's also have uh, men and white men listed 
uh, and really kind of negating the intention, you know, the targeted intention of what Ellie was asking for. And this person also happened to be a board member of the League of American Bicyclists. So since, you know, the, the, the intent for the Bike Equity Network was we just want to connect people, um, I didn't pay much attention at the beginning to, well, what if some people have a lot of institutional power with, say, the organization I work for, uh, and some people don't have anything like that kind of power, and, and they disagree, and the person with the power is uncomfortable with the topic and then shuts things down. Didn't anticipate that. And so when this started to unfold, uh, you know, a, a number of people reached out to me directly saying, we're this is not cool. You need to get this person off the list, sir. People felt very shut down. There was um, there was quite a response. And so there was some more back and forth around this. And um, ultimately, I did decide to remove this board member from the email list. Um, but that was, you know, really something I hadn't anticipated. You know, when, when we're trying to build this human infrastructure where we have different kinds of people connecting who maybe haven't been connected in the past, how do we attend to these kind of power differentials? Because there are going to be, uh, you know, people who have a bigger say over what happens with our institutions. So in 2014, we continued to uh, to do relationship building and movement building work through the Bike Equity Network. Um, hosted a, a conference called Future Bike that was held in conjunction with the Pro Walk, Pro Bike, Pro Place conference um, in Pittsburgh that fall. And, um, and we were continuing to, to build this conversation among people who wanted to talk about these topics and letting go of some of that, uh, you know, uh, thinking that we needed to also accommodate people who were uncomfortable with these topics. So one of the biggest things I've learned about doing equity work through the Bike Equity Network and, and the other things I've been involved in is, uh, you know, there is going to be emotional uh, stuff that comes up when there is a transfer of power going on um, and change going on. And in a lot of spaces, what we're talking about when we talk about equity is a transfer of power. It, it has to do with power sharing. It has to do with people who hold institutional power recognizing that they do, even if they themselves feel like they don't have a lot of power, which um, we all know is often the case when you're someone working on bicycling. You don't feel like you're the person with power in the room. but if you can recognize that power and see how to open it up and bring more people's experiences into um, you know, what they call being at the table or into the boardroom or into the lab where you're coming up with the ideas and the strategies, then the outcomes we're gonna get to are gonna meet the needs of more people. But when we get stuck in that emotional um, space where there's discomfort, where there's um, really personal work that needs to be done kind of feels stymied for everybody. And so um, so that's just a, a reality of, of doing work in the equity space. Sometimes uh, people's personal issues come up on, on both sides, not just people who maybe have benefited from white supremacy and institutional racism, also for people who have been oppressed, <laughs> there is a lot of um, fear and anger and distrust that can be part of the process. So, um, so I learned through, you know, having uh, supporting people in conversations in this listserv that that can be part of the space. Another thing I learned that I hadn't really taken into account at the beginning of this project was, uh, you know, did it really make sense to have a listserv where we had a kind of free exchange of ideas, doing that sort of connection between uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color folks, and white folks who were supporting equity and bicycling? Was that kind of like creating a space where exploitation could happen? So um, I'm sharing here a couple of examples from email threads that we had in 2015, where people pointed to uh, these kinds of issues. So uh, one person who is, uh, I would consider to be an elder in the bike equity space, uh, who this was an email thread talking about who was gonna go to this conference, um, said, I applied for a scholarship, but I didn't make the cut. 
too expensive for me to attend without scholarship assistance. So even though this was a conference that was about racial equity, where it would have been great to have this person's voice in the in the mix, he couldn't actually get there, right? So, um, so you know, what was being done to actually create spaces where uh, more people could be in the conversation? And then the second example um, that I have posted here as an image uh, comes from another person who is an elder in the bike equity space who um, pointed out that there is a pattern of inequity in compensation and recognition for the contributions that unpaid and lower compensated community members make at greater levels of sacrifice to be part of the equity conversation. Um, and then large organizations may inadvertently co-opt or fail to adequately value the intellectual property they harness from community leaders to help their campaigns prosper. So in the absence of addressing these kind of economic inequities and these, these different ways that we value or don't value skill sets that contribute to um, bike equity, uh, you know, I hadn't really considered at the beginning when I was just thinking on a theoretical level, like, okay, let's build the human infrastructure, let's build a network where more people can participate. Um, how are these sorts of things going to be attended to? And, and I went through my own uh, transition in 2015, where I left my employment with the League of American Bicyclists, um, but continued to be uh, the, the moderator of the Bike Equity Network. And so, uh, you know, myself went through recognizing that uh, even though there were a lot of efforts from people in the bike, uh, you know, industry, advocacy, planning, just community-based bike projects to, uh, to build a more multiracial um, space and to you know, address inequity. There were also people um, in the institutions that hold a lot of ownership around bicycling who were ready to give lip service to these topics, but not actually get into the nitty gritty of addressing um, you know, uh, investment in different things, sharing power around what strategies uh, were going to be promoted that might, um, you know, tie in more with the realities in communities of color or low income communities. So I left uh, working in bicycle advocacy. And um, one of the things that I then moved into being part of in 2016 was creating a different kind of network um, than the bike equity network uh, based on some of the things that I had learned from being part of the bike equity network or having started the bike equity network. So one of those really had to do with setting some boundaries. So those issues that we'd had with bike equity network around, you know, who's, uh, whose perspective is going to be centered. Uh, what do we do about these power differentials? What about, you know, just connecting people but not having compensation in place so there could be exploitation? With this project that um, came to be named the Untokening, uh, we specifically decided to create um, some uh, metrics for who we wanted to invite into the space and who could participate. And so we had our first event in, um, in the fall of 2016 in Atlanta. And uh, in order to register for this event, we asked people to disclose, um, you know, what was their racial identity? Did they, besides race, have other identities that had led to them uh, being marginalized, like uh, gender-wise, in terms of ability, uh, being part of LGBTQ communities? Um, and then we made sure that the people who registered for the conference uh, created a majority of people of color uh, participating in the space. Um, I think for the first event, we said it would be two thirds uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and then for subsequent events, we got to 75%. And so that way we did have, we've always had people um, in the untokening space who are white, but we also have uh, a, a super majority in terms of uh, wanting to talk about things in a way where whiteness doesn't have to be centered as the starting point. Um, and the untokening group uh, helped me to shift into thinking beyond just bike equity and more broadly thinking about this concept of mobility justice, 
where, um, you know, when my starting point with working on bike equity was recognizing that we needed to build a bigger we, we needed to address the segregation in um, our cities that caused us to not feel common cause around things like sustainable transportation. Um, at that time, uh, I didn't have as much of an understanding of, you know, the, the realities of uh, pushback that we might encounter in the bicycling space. And I was really myself coming at things as a bicycle advocate. Um, you know, I, uh, like I said, I, I lived car free in LA for years. I very much identify with, um, you know, bicycling as a, as a lifestyle that has to do with pushing back against oil consumption, pushing back against capitalist exploitation. You know, for me, that's a big part of my identity as a, as a person. And um, what I came to understand through being part of the bike equity network, through learning from people around the country who do uh, bicycle work in communities of color and low-income communities is sometimes the bike's not the answer. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, it was kind of, uh, it was a journey for me to, to recognize that um, if we really want to get more people benefiting from sustainable transportation, reducing pollution in our cities, reducing fatalities, making our streets into a, a more positive living space as opposed to a, a, a dangerous and violent space. Um, there's gonna be a lot of different perspectives on transportation, cultural views on transportation that are gonna be in the mix. And um, you know, the bicycle can't be at the center in all of those, it's just not. And we have a lot of people out there who have really valid reasons for viewing uh, transportation modes the way that they do that may not, you know, uh, reflect my experience. And if we actually want to have a respectful, collaborative approach to this stuff, we have to recognize that. So for me, um, I would say I don't work on bike equity anymore, and I haven't for years. Now I work on this concept of mobility justice, where we are talking about sustainable transportation and making our streets safer, specifically through the lens of uh, saying who has been the least safe, who has had to face the most violence and the most barriers to be able to travel freely and safely. And so um, for the Untokening Network, the way we talk about mobility justice, that means when we're looking at making streets safer, we might also have to talk about police violence. We might have to look at how partnering with police departments to increase ticketing isn't necessarily going to be an equitable solution. Um, we have to look at what are the other things going on that make someone feel unsafe when they're biking besides whether they get to be in a cycle track or not. Um, where I live in Los Angeles, in South Los Angeles, there has been a big uptick in gun violence um, during the pandemic years. And so the sense of vulnerability that people might have based on fears about um, that kind of violence, you know, how do we how do we connect that to what we're talking about with street safety and transportation? So, um, so working in the mobility justice space has been, um, for me, really uh, a way to build on the, the work that I was doing around bike equity, but thinking beyond bicycling um, and thinking more broadly about how all these things fit together and how we can build a more inclusive um, approach to safe, sustainable transportation. But again, I just want to, the reason I'm bringing up the untokening is there were lessons learned from, um, from not having boundaries around participation in the bike equity network that, um, you know, led to the folks who created the untokening. All of us had been participants in the bike equity network. Um, we, we learned, okay, well, we need to do things a little differently and let's intentionally create um, a specific kind of conversation space and, and do visioning work within that. And then, you know, uh, what we've seen over the years since we released our uh, principles of mobility justice in 2017, uh, has really been that, uh, you know, we've, we've been able to help spark dialogue and be a resource for people, you know, way beyond our own um, untokening network um, as, as people work on this mobility justice concept. So bike equity network still exists today, but um, 
my role with it uh, really changed after I left the League of American Bicyclists and after I shifted into working with the Untokening. Um, these days and in the past few years, I've played much more of a just moderator role, approving uh, people joining, things like that. And for a while, I, I kind of, um, I didn't really see a future for the list because it seemed like maybe it was part of a certain moment in uh, the bike movement conversation. Maybe folks had other places to be uh, in dialogue. Maybe we didn't need to have it. Um, there is someone who I think deserves special recognition, Jessica Roberts, who uh, is a principal at Alta Planning in Portland. Um, Jessica started a tradition pretty early in the life of the Bike Equity Network of sending out um, weekly job listings in, uh, in bicycling, uh, transportation, and TDM fields. And uh, she's kept up that tradition just tirelessly. And so um, in, in times when there haven't been a lot of uh, email threads or conversation threads going on on the bike equity network. It has been this job board. And so over the years, I've always seen people joining um, because they want to find out about the jobs. A lot of people will tell me when they request to join, you know, I'm, I'm a recently graduated student or I'm moving, looking for a job. Um, but something happened in 2020 when, um, you know, for for many people, um, maybe it was the first time they were being confronted by the realities of police violence and the special harm done to black communities, or maybe it was just a time to be regalvanized around that. After George Floyd was murdered, um, and we had, you know, so many good months of energy around um, protests and wanting to take care of uh, black communities. Uh, there was a big uptick in people joining this email list. And so it led me to want to reflect more on, well, what is this as a resource for people? Um, what is it that they you know, want to be joining for? And so uh, this past fall, I did a, a webinar where um, I reached out to everybody who's on the list. There's about a thousand subscribers to the Bike Equity Network now and said, um, hey, I want to you know, tell the story of this list and find out how it's working for people. Um, and so what I heard in that space and from emails people sent me is that uh, on the Bike Equity Network, they're finding job listings. They appreciate the salary transparency for transportation jobs. Um, it's great to have an informal directory for people doing equity work across the country. And because the list has been around for uh, you know almost nine years now, we have a really big archive of conversation threads where people can just search and uh, and find answers to questions. And then um, I have a quote as the last thing on the list here that stood out to me from um, a woman who participated in the webinar where she said, I'm in rural northern Minnesota and a longtime bike advocate. The list helps me stay informed about what folks are working on about racial justice in active transportation. So even though for, for me and a lot of people I know who work on the untokening or in other ways have um, you know, been able to do more equity and justice work in the transportation space, um, there are still people out there who don't get to participate in a community of practice, a, a, a thinking group locally where um, they can be uh, advocating around this stuff. And so that really made me think, huh, okay, so this list um, maybe is continuing to play a role, even though from my standpoint, it's not as active, um, there's something it's doing. So, so where I am today with uh, the Bike Equity Network, I'm still the owner, still the moderator. Um, and I'm thinking that I want to uh, work on turning the, uh, the archives into maybe something like a book or just a resource um, that can be available to more people. And um, so I appreciated having um, this opportunity to come in and reflect a bit on, um, on, on how this project of building human infrastructure has worked. And, um, and I'm, I'm really interested actually, if folks have um, uh, ideas about you know, how to utilize this resource or um, how it fits in with the mobility justice and transportation equity landscape beyond just um, the bicycle topic. Um, so I'll uh, stop there. I guess actually the last thing I want to say is um, I'm very excited that uh, I'm going to be making a transition professionally 
uh, in the near future to work for the Institute for Transportation Studies at UCLA um, on um, uh, doing some equity research uh, management there. And so I'll be starting that job in June. And so that's kind of bringing me back to thinking about how to um, support a resource like the Bike Equity Network, um, even though I've been working in uh, urban sustainability for the last few years. Um, so just open to, to questions and comments and uh, thanks for listening. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. And there was some good news there um, at the end, a little surprise um, for us and uh, great news. Um, so we have um, a few questions that have come in already and I invite um, all of you to add more questions to the Q&A. I will take care of one that came up front at the very beginning before you started talking. And that's more about the seminar. We will be doing, um, we are planning some in-person seminars in the spring. Um, we're, we're working through some of the additional logistics of the campus sort of really reopening to non-students um, in terms of building access and things. So stay tuned, um, though we will always continue to live um, webcast um, our seminars. Um, and I did, you know, Adonia, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, we invited you in, uh, I forgot what year now, but I did, there is a YouTube video um, of that um, seminar. If, if, I don't know, if I, if I were you, I probably wouldn't go back and watch it, but I'm sure others may want to. Um, so let me jump into some of these questions. And first of all, I want to say I really enjoyed your talk and the way you approached it. So sort of telling your story and being honest about sort of the challenges of doing this work. And I think um, that can particularly be good, or useful for people to listen to who are feeling uncomfortable trying to navigate these topics. And so I, I do appreciate um, the talk and how you approached it. So I am going to start um, towards the top of these um, and handling them. And um, one um, question that came in from someone who is on a local bike and pedestrian advisory committee. And the broad question is um, about the problem of creating a way where people of color feel encouraged and welcome to participate. And what are some ways we can meaningfully do that? Because this person gave an example of they were trying to do some outreach of a survey and didn't really get input from those communities, even though they did do things like Russian and Spanish translation of the survey. Yeah, that is, uh, you know, such a such a common issue. Uh, and one of the institutions that I've had the uh, good fortune to work with um, is called Pueblo Planning. Uh, and I recently wrapped up a stint um, working there for Monique Lopez and uh, Pueblo, and they're not the only uh, place that has this approach, but there's a lot of planning firms out there that put a really big focus on doing creative um, engagement. And what they found is, you know, it's just hard to get people to answer surveys. Um, you know, I, ideally, we could use survey methodology and get responses from the people who we really need to hear from, and it would be great. Um, but it's just it's not a modality that um, that works for everybody. Uh, maybe someone just doesn't have the time. Maybe it's tough to you know navigate the structure of the questions. So um, doing community engagement work that can also be research and gathering data um, is one way to to go about things differently. And so the method that Pueblo Planning uses and um, and similar firms that I'm um, aware of use is mostly partnering with community-based organizations um, so that you are actually going to the institutions that have deep ties to the, the communities that need to be represented and, um, and working through what makes sense on their end. So that does mean shifting from a survey methodology to to doing something else it might be focus groups it might be um you know uh community-based workshops um and also being very clear about um how the data from those spaces is going to be developed and used that might mean having to you know do some uh, a relationship building with agency staff so that they're ready to take in the kind of data that's going to come out of those kind of processes. 
Um, but in terms of what I've seen, I think that's just the most robust way to go about things. Sometimes we just need to change methodologies and, um, and recognize that they're the people who are holding community knowledge, um, we need to set up ways of meeting with them and learning from them that work um, on their end and also compensate them for their time. So, so we have to, yeah. Uh, be willing to to invest more in that data gathering process in order to to get the results we need. And I, I think that relates to a comment here um, of instead of waiting till we're making a decision um, that um, this input and process needs to happen much earlier so that we really learn perspectives and needs. And that was a, a comment that came in. Um, there are a couple, more than one question on here about um, gentrification, and I'll, I'll just choose one of them to capture, and that is how can bike advocates dismantle associations between bike infrastructure and gentrification within bike park communities? That's a, that's a big question, right? <laughs> I think my, my narrative around this, um, which, you know, I haven't done formal research to check this narrative. So it's kind of more like this is the story that I've developed based on being in conversations about bicycling with advocates and planners um, for the last uh, a long time, 14 years. Uh, well, I think that what happened and how we do damage control, it, it matters what happened in order to figure out the strategies for damage control. I think that making a link between economic development and bicycle infrastructure or street changes that are more human scaled. I think that that was a strategic decision that was made by people promoting bicycling because that's what elected officials are looking for. They, um, you know, when you're a mayor, when you're a city council person, when you're a representative, you're supposed to be showing that you're supporting growth in your city or in the district that you represent. And um, that's the paradigm that we're working with. Uh, there's a lot of us who think that that paradigm isn't very sustainable and we need to transition to something that is going to be less focused on growth or you know growth as defined by um, you know industries in a city. But that that's that's what elected officials um, have been have been looking for. And so I think that bike advocates uh, came up with a recipe that would kind of meet meet that need that they saw from elected officials. The idea of, you know, if we are going to make streets safer for biking, then we need to build infrastructure. Well, how do you get agencies and and um, municipalities to invest in infrastructure? Well, you get the elected officials to support it because you're not going to get that support from these very um, automobile design oriented, um, you know, uh, departments of transportation, We've got to get the elected officials on board. And so in pursuit of that political will, um, I think that there has been a lot of, uh, you know, reporting and, and um, uh, research that has pointed to a connection between economic development and bicycle infrastructure. So from a different perspective where cities are already too expensive, where, you know, we have increasing uh, homelessness, where we have just this big old mismatch between um, what people are getting paid and how much they have to pay for housing and all this different stuff. Uh, the idea that bike infrastructure is going to come in as part of neighborhoods having economic growth looks like gentrification. And that looks like getting shut out. And it looks like you know, a, a strategy to displace communities who, you know, have already um, had a hard enough time hanging on. So, so that's, that's to, from what I have, you know, learned over the years, it really seems like there was maybe just a, a miscalculation, a misstep in strategy. And, and again, it just results from the fact that um, we as a country are a, a product of segregation and, um, you know, the way that our urban planning has been done, the way our transportation planning has been done has reflected that. Um, we have not been, you know, uh, coming up with uh, visions for future transportation and future streets that necessarily had everybody's needs taken into account. Um, but what I have seen in the last uh, you know, gosh, how long have I been working with this bike equity concept since 2013? 
almost 10 years is there's a lot of people who are trying to figure out how to do things differently. And, um, you know, I think it goes way beyond uh, bicycle uh, advocacy or research or transportation advocacy and research to address this issue that we have with um, how expensive our cities are becoming. But I think that that's, that's the way to go to, um, to try and dismantle some of that association between gentrification and bike infrastructure is acknowledge um, that, that there were that association didn't come from nowhere that actually there you know there were um reasons why uh that idea was promoted that you know biking means business biking's good for economic development and and maybe clarify well what do we mean when we say economic development um because you know economies are part of human culture and uh you know we're always going to have an economy so how do we build an economy that is going to serve more people and build a more just economy and so um, i personally have been uh, very interested in what's called the just transition framework in the last few years um, something i've learned about from a colleague of mine in the urban sustainability program i run and um, the just transition framework which comes out of years of work in um, labor and the environmental world where they've had to figure out okay so if we're going to cut back on fossil fuels that also means cutting back on jobs and fossil fuels those are oftentimes very good working uh, jobs, you know, union represented jobs. So the idea of the just transition as an answer to that, and that I think is relevant here too, is what's the world we're working in today, which is really predicated on exploitation, exploitation of natural resources, exploitation of, you know, workers. We still have, you know, a lot of new mobility companies have been created that unfortunately carry um the profit model that uh that says you need to pay workers as little as possible or not even call them workers just get as much work as you can out of people um that's the world we have today what is the world and set of economic relationships we would like to have um we would like to have economies where we're taking care of uh families where people can afford to live in you know the communities they've been part of we want to be in these regenerative economic systems so the just transition is how do we go from this uh you know uh, world that is rooted in a capitalist notion of of unsustainable growth to a world that's rooted in community care and um, I think in terms of transportation, there's a lot more good thinking we can do about what that looks like. And, um, and you know, when we say economic growth, we can be a lot more clear around what we mean and, um, and who we want to be part of that, maybe in particular people who've been left out um, in the past. So those are just some of my thoughts there, but that's a big topic. I think there's a lot more to be said. Um, but now, a oh, wonderful answer, okay. I'm going to um, just read this question um, from Maria Sippen. Um, how have you seen expertise, and that's in quotes, shift in the spaces you've worked in or nurtured? One of the biggest things I've learned from the Bike Equity Network and from mobility justice networks in general is how undervalued and poorly recognized lived experience or non-academic experience has been in transportation and the power dynamics in valuing formal planning, engineering, transportation education versus those who have had other paths. That's a great question, and um, and so nice to uh, to hear from Maria, who's been a longtime collaborator of mine and has been in all of these spaces and conversations. Um, I think that again, when you put things into this more economic framework, um, where we're thinking not just about okay, how do we get to safer streets through engineering and through planning, but also how do we get to safer streets through community care and um, you know, reducing gun violence, reducing police violence, then that starts to open up the kinds of skill sets and expertises that we need to be 
um, bringing into the scope of our work. I would say that someone who's a transportation engineer probably doesn't feel like an expert in, uh, you know, developing community safety alternatives to policing. So, um, you know, the people who are out there who have been working on um, those sorts of things in overburdened communities, um, I think have a lot of expertise to share. And our role in transportation is to be curious and collaborative and, um, and recognize that there are, um, you know, these really great movements and strategies and, um, and professions out there that can um, be helping. Because uh, I would say a lot of times when I've encountered um, people whose lived experience uh, of bicycling um, or, you know, doing sustainable transportation uh, is really valuable. Like they, they live in a neighborhood that, you know, maybe wouldn't get a great walk score or bike score, but actually you can navigate it um, without a car, you know, using creative strategies. That person um, probably does have a, a job <laughs> and maybe works in another industry that's not related to transportation. So um, what are the ways that we could be expanding out our idea of, you know, um, uh, what skill sets need to be in the picture and, um, and what it is we're trying to do when we're, when we're building safer streets and what kinds of, of community-based knowledges need to be part of that process. Um, a little bit related to this, a very focused question um, is uh, specifically, you mentioned the job listings that, that you see on this, um, on the network. Um, and a question is, you know, are there jobs if you only have a bachelor's degree um, for working in this field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of jobs that are that are posted. Um, and yeah, people are really great with posting the jobs. Like I, I always have to, you know, give kudos to Jessica um, because she is absolutely the, the queen of the, the job listings, but lots and lots of people share um, jobs on there. So I do think it's a resource for any level. Not Most people who are on that list are not uh, PhDs like me. Excellent. Um, I wanted to make sure we answered that question because even though I knew the answer, um, I want I, I want more people in this field with all sorts of backgrounds. Um, moving on to a different question and topic. Are there opportunities, are there any opportunities that you see coming out of this pandemic that may help with bicycle advocacy, especially in communities of color? Do you see any opportunities to work on bicycle advocacy in suburban communities where bicycling has not been as popular or safe, particularly related to pandemic? That's a good question. Um, I feel like the, the answers are going to be so place specific, um, just in terms of, you know, how have people been activated um, through the pandemic times, like um, where I live in LA, uh, one of the things that emerged during the pandemic was this really strong network of um, uh, local food sharing systems. Um, there was a free fridge uh, movement that started happening and free fridges being maintained in a number of different neighborhoods. We have uh, at least three different black led local food projects that are ongoing. Um, two of them are looking to find space to open organic grocery stores. There's all this stuff and it, and it you know, I, it may be that it became visible to me during the pandemic for whatever reason, but I think a lot of it grew during um, the pandemic. So, so I think in each place it's finding out where, um, you know, what did, what did the pandemic's disruption of our, our normal lives lead to in terms of people's energy um, and then, you know, making a connection there to transportation. But I have to say, you know, I do feel concerned that, um, and this was something that occurred to me when, um, you know, the, when Trump got elected in 2016, was when a lot of people feel scared, how is that going to impact our um, willingness to be out and about and in, in transportation modes that might feel vulnerable, like bicycling? Um, and I think that there's a, maybe some, some attention that needs to be paid there. Um, the pandemic has been devastating in completely unequal ways, right? Like 
I can't, I personally can't begin to <laughs> um, process, you know, how it has impacted my family versus how it has impacted, you know, other families that have lost multiple elders, lost multiple, you know, uh, heads of household. So because it has been so unequal and so devastating in strange ways, I think that um, community care is really, really, really needed. And, um, and we are dealing with, you know, a, a kind of polarized political moment where people, I don't know, and thinking of suburbs, I'm like, are they suburbs where everybody shares political views? Or are they suburbs where they don't share political views? Because I think that has something to do with how safe a person's going to feel, you know, out there um, being exposed. But I have always, you know, one of the things that has been so, um, why I've stayed, you know, uh, in the bicycle space for so long is so many people use bicycling as this fantastic community building tool, you know, like going on a bike ride. It, it, it's like healing in these ways that I don't, I don't, I think that researchers are working on understanding, but that we don't fully understand yet. And so I think there's always good potential for, um, for bicycle organizing and, and just spending time together on bikes to be part of a recovery. Um, but I, but I do think, you know, dang, people, people are hurt and we have to figure out um, what those special hurts are and, and how to attend to them. So I'm going to try to um, combine a couple questions here. We have great questions and limited time. So I'm going to try to combine a couple here. Um, and, and, and I think perhaps appropriate to end on in terms of questions. Um, what is your vision of an ideal cycling community? And it goes on. What do you see physically when you look at it? And I'm also going to combine another question of perhaps not just the physical, but what about in terms of sort of legal and other institutions in terms of that um, ideal cycling community? And what do you hear from the people in that community? I know that's a big question. That's nice though, nice one to, to finish with. I think when I think of an ideal cycling community, um, there are, you know, people out there riding with kids and kids riding on their own. And there are people carrying cargo on their bikes. Um, something that I think we can really learn from uh, uh, countries in Latin America and um, in Southeast Asia and different African countries is carrying stuff with our, with our bikes um, and using it to you know, run businesses. So I see bikes being part of a local economy um, and also, you know, just being a kind of normal part of what we're doing. They're not something special. They're not something luxury. They're just a functional thing that's, that's part of our landscape. But alongside bikes, I think there's a lot of other kinds of, of you know, mobility that's happening. And, um, you know, people feel like they have access to the kind of mobility that they need um, or that they want to have fun with. And they also have a place to sleep. Um, they know they're going to get food. Um, they, you know, are, are not having to live with this sense of, you know, uh, what's going to happen. I have to, you know, watch out for myself because nobody else is watching out for me. And we have people we can call when we need help who are trained to come and, you know, de-escalate if there's a conflict or attend in a way that's not just going to make people feel more hurt and more uh, dehumanized. Um, so I think that uh, that's, I see the bicycle as being part of this larger holistic vision. And, um, and, and again, one of the things that's kept me in the bike space is that I think there's a lot of people for whom that matches what their, what their vision is um, of bicycling. It's just that we as individuals um, have more to do around building relationships so that when we see that vision, it's coinciding with a vision where you know, the people are, uh, you know, many <laughs> come from many backgrounds and many ways of being in public space um, and not just having, you know, one idea. Like, uh, I think that it's also a noisy 
a noisy place, this, uh, this neighborhood where there's a lot of biking going on, people calling to each other. Um, and, and that's okay. Nobody feels threatened because there's a uh, noise happening because it's not uh, some kind of violence. It's, uh, you know, that there's just a, a way of being that um, uh, embraces different communication styles. I love that answer. And um, to me, your answer really focused on the people and the functions and what they are doing and not on the, the inanimate objects around the, those people. So I love that vision. Um, but with that, we are um, at the end um, of our time. I really wanna thank um, Adonia. This has been lovely. I am going to wrap up and remind everyone um, that if you are not, please sign up for our newsletter so you can hear about um, other events in the future. And at the uh, right after you sign out here, you're, there, there will be a quick survey. Um, we'd love your feedback um, on this and our seminars in general. Um, so with that, I also, again, thank you so much, Adonia. This has been lovely. And um, those of you, we will be posting the recording and the slides um, later on today so you can share it with your friends and colleagues as well. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the invitation. Have a great weekend, everybody. You too.